Heavenly Father, we come to you, the giver of all grace. And Lord, we commit to you what the day has been like, and we come now around your word. We fought in the worship partly about the, what we share, Lord, and we share in your words uh, the fact that we can all look at it and the fact that we can look at it together. And we pray for your blessing on this time now, Lord. Help us to lose sight of other things that might be on our minds or uh, weighing on our bodies. And we just pray that you would set us free from all of those things, Lord, to really hear what you want to say. Lord, speak powerfully uh, in some way tonight, we ask, Lord, for we look to you. Uh, the only one who can do that, Lord, no man can do that, Lord, but you can bring it about. So would you help us all, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the verse, just to start off with uh, in Psalm 84 tonight, is verse 10. We're about being a, a doorkeeper, but let's uh, read a few verses just to get the context. We'll read from verse 5. How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. The psalm also starts by talking about how lovely the Lord's dwelling places are, and that's really what is revisited in verse 10. Uh, in the version I just read, it said, I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God. In some other versions, for example, the New King James, it says, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God. That might be the version that we know better from uh, the fact it's quoted that way uh, very often. And in the context, we see that the psalmist saying that it is better to be even on the outskirts of the Lord's presence than to be right in the heart of the tents of wickedness. Uh, you know, you can have all that the world has to offer. You can be best friends with loads of people. You can have all of the money and fame in the world. You can be right in the heart of things, and yet it's not as good as being just on the outskirts of the Lord's presence. That's really what it's saying. And yet we tend to think of the thing about being a doorkeeper uh, in a, a different way. We sometimes jokingly use the phrase that it's better to be a doorkeeper in Christian circles when we're holding the door open for somebody, don't we? Well, maybe you don't. I think I've done that from time to time. And if, I've, if you've not done it, you've probably heard others do it. You know, they hold the door up and say, yeah, better to be a doorkeeper. Uh, and the implication being that a doorkeeper is quite a, a lowly position. Uh, you know, it's a bit of a menial thing, really, but, but it's better to be that than, than not to be in the Lord's uh, service, perhaps is one way of putting it. And certainly this verse is contrasting a lowly position with a nice one. The lowly position of being on the outskirts of the temple versus being right in the middle of the tents of wickedness, which can seem nice at the time. And attending a door which others get to pass through, but you have to stay stationed there, does make you perhaps feel a bit of a servant. You know, it's servants who serve their masters who are better than, than them or have more money or more power than them. So perhaps doorkeepers are the same. But I think we miss something about doorkeepers if that's all we see about them. And tonight I just want to just think a bit about doorkeepers and one particular role that they have to play uh, which was very important at that time. Now, doorkeepers generally, besides just in the temple, were important. In a city you would, that had walls, you would have the strong gates, and they would be shut, 
at times to make sure that the enemy couldn't get in, to keep the wrong sort of people out. And if the gatekeepers didn't do their job properly, the whole city could be invaded and even destroyed. So it was quite an important position. But what about in the house of the Lord? Did doorkeepers just hold doors open for people? Well, I don't actually know if even the doors needed to be held open. Uh, you know, maybe they were uh, wedged open. I don't know if they had door wedges then. But, um, you know, they, they might have been opened, you know, and they might have needed to hold them open. But what was the function of a doorkeeper? Was it just ceremonial? Was it just so that people didn't have to open the doors themselves? Well, we see the answer most clearly in 2 Chronicles 23, reading from verse 16. So let's turn there, please. 2 Chronicles chapter 23. And we'll read in a moment from verse 16. Well, before we read it, I'll just set the context for this passage. This event happened at the start of young Josiah's reign. This is just as Queen Athaliah had been put to death by the command of Jehoiada, the priest. So it's just as a wicked queen has been put to death. But we should also consider the generations before her, starting with Jehoshaphat. Now Jehoshaphat we would probably think of generally as a righteous king. He put in some good reforms. Uh, he's clearly sought the Lord in different ways. There's the famous situation where he was under the threat of attack and invasion and he sought the Lord. The Lord uh, gave a wonderful promise of deliverance and then they were able to praise the Lord and, and have the victory uh, as the Lord answered their prayers. So he led a largely righteous reign. Then his son Jehoram reigned wickedly for eight years. In fact, Jehoram put all of Jehoshaphat's other sons to death so that they couldn't seize his throne. After Jehoram's eight-year reign, his son reigned wickedly for one year and was then killed. And then his mother, Athaliah, seized the throne, killed the other heirs and ruled for six or seven years before finally Jehoiada stepped in and brought King, uh, Josiah to be king. So we have Jehoram's wicked reign, Ahaziah's brief, brief wicked reign, and Athaliah's wicked reign. But we can trace the wickedness of them back to Jehoshaphat in one sense, despite his righteousness. Because Jehoshaphat was twice criticised for sinful alliances. In fact, in one place he said that he had done wickedly. We tend to box people off, don't we? We say, oh, they were either a righteous king or a wicked king. But Jehoshaphat, although generally righteous, twice allied himself with the kings of Israel, who certainly were wicked. First he did it with Ahab, and if you know your Bibles, you'll know that he was a very wicked king. And then later, when Ahab had died, he allied himself with Ahab's son. His alliance included marriage, we see in 2 Chronicles 18. And Jehoshaphat's son Jehoram continued the alliance with Israel, because Jehoram married Ahab's daughter, which was Athaliah. And then when, Ahaz, when um, Jehoram had died, Athaliah counselled their son Ahaziah to do evil. So Athaliah kept up her father Ahab's wickedness. And when Ahaziah died, Athaliah herself, as I've said, killed the other heirs and led a wicked reign. The sin and bloodshed of these three later kings and queens, can be traced partly back to Jehoshaphat because he shared fellowship with evil men rather than separating himself from them. He went into battle with them, he married into their line and because of that, or partly because of that, then his son carried things on, he was wicked, the influence of Ahab was felt through uh, Jeho uh, Jehoram's wife and it all carried on from there. And that's important. I mention all this because I think it's relevant to the crucial role of gatekeepers that we're going to see now here. So here as we come to verse 16 of 2 Chronicles 23, it says, Then Jehoiada made a covenant between himself and all the people and the king, 
that they would be the Lord's people. So this is just as they set up Josiah on his throne and Athaliah has been killed. And all the people went to the house of Baal and tore it down. And they broke in pieces his altars and his images and killed Matan the priest of Baal before the altars. Moreover, Jehoiada placed the offices of the house of the Lord under the authority of the Levitical priests, whom David had assigned over the house of the Lord, to offer the burnt offerings of the Lord, as it is written in the law of Moses, with rejoicing and singing, according to the order of David. He stationed the gatekeepers of the house of the Lord, so that no one would enter who was in any way unclean. So here we have it, at this crucial moment when Jehoiada the priest was trying to put things right from how they'd been before. One of the key things he does is station gatekeepers in and probably around in some way the house of the Lord. And the reason, the primary reason given for these gatekeepers wasn't to hold the door open for somebody. It was so that no one would enter who was in any way unclean. Now various things in the Old Testament law would make people unclean, either permanently or temporarily. Uh, leprosy, for example. As long as you were leprous and contagious that way, you were unclean. Uh, certain nationalities were not allowed into the temple or the, the, the temple precincts. Contact with a corpse. Uh, even relations, physical relations between husband and wife, there were certain things which for a time meant you were unclean until a certain time had uh, elapsed or until you'd cleansed yourself, uh, whatever it might have been. Now I'm not sure how the gatekeepers checked people were clean. I did spend a little bit of time thinking about it and then I thought, oh, no, I'll leave that one aside. Uh, but perhaps they had to have some awkward conversation with people, I don't know. How they made sure, you know, are you, you know have you touched a corpse today? Uh, I don't know, I <laughs> don't know what they did. But their aim was to make sure that nobody who was unclean at that moment could come within the boundaries of the Lord's dwelling place. And of course, even if somebody was generally clean, if they weren't the specific priests of the Lord, they couldn't enter into the holy place. And so they, they had to make sure that only the Levitical priests who were chosen and set apart by the Lord could do that. Anybody who didn't meet these criteria, it was the gatekeeper's job to deny them entry. However hard that might be, however awkward, However well they knew the person, they had to say, I'm sorry, this is a holy place. You can't come in. Or you can't come in right now if, it, if they were temporarily unclean. Why was this? Because God was holy. Tony reminded us the other week about God's holiness from the prophet's vision in Isaiah 6. And he was saying, you know, one way of describing the Lord being holy is that he is different so different from us, so different from the world, in a much higher way, the Lord is different from us. And if God is holy, then his dwelling place has to be holy too. If God is different from the world, his dwelling place has to be different from the world. The things that are okay in the world aren't okay in his dwelling place. Somebody who had touched a corpse, maybe they could have done other things within the Lord's community, but they couldn't come to his dwelling place. So what was okay, generally outside of the Lord's temple or tabernacle area, wasn't okay within. Take a moment to imagine an interaction though between a gatekeeper and someone wanting to enter. I was thinking, you know, the gatekeeper might ask them if they're clean, and the other person might say, well, Technically, not until evening, but it's nearly evening. Can I come in? You know, you know, it's, it's close. Or, um, well, I did touch a corpse, but it was only for a second. You know, five-second rule. I don't know if that existed for corpses like it does for food, seemingly. But, you know, I'm just imagining here. But it could have been so easy for the gatekeepers, you know, slightly to compromise. Maybe not be fully completing things to the letter of the law. But maybe if it was somebody they knew. And maybe normally they'd be very strict, but this person, their friends say, okay, go on, I'll let you in. Because it's too awkward to challenge them. 
how easily a doorkeeper might let things slip in their duty. And yet their duty was a very solemn one. If they did let things slip, they would be responsible in some way for the temple being defiled and God's holy place being compromised. So it needed certain qualities to be a doorkeeper. One of them was boldness. And we see this in 2 Chronicles 26. So if you just turn just over to chapter 26, we have the sad story of King Uzziah. 2 Chronicles 26, we'll read from verse 16. This is after a very good reign, or towards the end of a very good reign. He's been very righteous and done great things. He's shown a good heart towards the Lord. But then in verse 16 it says, When he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly, and he was unfaithful to the Lord his God. For he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Then Azariah the priest entered after him. That's the chief priest we see further down. And with him eighty priests of the Lord, valiant men. They opposed Uzziah the king and said to him, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful and will have no honour from the Lord God. But Uzziah, with a censer in his hand for burning incense, was enraged. And while he was enraged with the priests, the leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord beside the altar of incense. Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous on his forehead. And they hurried him out of there, and he himself also hastened to get out, because the Lord had smitten him. King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death, and he lived in a separate house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord." So in passing, we might note that there, King Uzziah was permanently unclean, permanently unable to enter because he became a leper, which was because of his pride. And we can see this is one of the areas, one of the ways in which we can end up profaning things that are holy is when we become proud. But what I really want to draw attention to is the actions of Azariah, the chief priest, and those with him. They entered after him. I don't know if they'd realised what the king was trying to do. They obviously couldn't stop him as it was happening. Or maybe somebody was stationed there, but maybe they were fearful. It's the king. Can't stop him. Can stop anybody else, but I can't stop the king. But whatever happened, these men went after the king. And they challenged him. It's quite strong what he says. Get out of the sanctuary. Now when we remember that the king was so powerful in those days... That's quite a thing to say. King Saul, and various kings beforehand, King Saul had killed a whole lot of the priests of the Lord when they had annoyed him. Uh, unfairly, of course, he had unfairly killed them and he was judged partly because of that. But it was no small thing to f uh, square off against the king of the day. But Azariah the priest does that. And even tells him he's been unfaithful and will have no honour from the Lord God. He was very clear. He says, this is not for you to do it. This is for the priests. Azariah knew the law. And he knew what was right and what was wrong. What was holy and what wasn't. Notice that the ones who went with him are described as valiant men. Valiant men. That term is often used for warriors. You know, when you go through the genealogies, every now and then it talks about such and such a tribe with so many thousands of valiant men for war. And it makes sense for war, doesn't it, that you need to be valiant. And yet here, these priests are described as valiant men. Maybe they never use that uh, valiance, is that a word? Uh, valiance in, uh, in battle. But they needed it here. This one time, at least in their lives, they needed that valiant attitude, because they were going to challenge the king of all people over this matter of unholiness. So clearly boldness 
is one of the things that's needed for a doorkeeper. That boldness must have been lacking later on uh, in future generations because when Manasseh was king, he filled the temple with idols. Where were the gatekeepers? What were they doing that they allowed that? They obviously didn't have the boldness of Azariah. Presumably, the high priest didn't have the boldness of Azariah. There's certainly no record of it. And Ahaz, soon afterwards, he removed things from the temple, brought in unholy things, and then later closed the doors completely. I would have thought the doorkeepers should have had something to say about that. Their job wasn't just to keep the wrong people out, it was also to make sure the doors were open for the right people to come in. But they allowed the doors to be closed. Where were the valiant priests of the Lord then? I wonder if they gradually lost their courage or gradually lost their discernment. Because discernment is another thing. If boldness is needed, discernment is another. Now there's an instruction given in Leviticus 10. And it's just after Nadab and Abihu have been killed because they tried to offer strange fire, strange incense to the Lord, and the fire of the Lord consumed them because they were not treating him as holy. And just after that, in Leviticus 10 and verse 8, it says, The Lord spoke to Aaron, the high priest, saying, Do not drink wine or strong drink, neither you nor your sons with you, when you come into the tent of meeting, so that you will not die. It is a perpetual statute throughout your generations, and so as to make a distinction between the holy and the profane, and between the unclean and the clean. We don't know whether Nadab and Abihu had been on the bottle, shall we say, before they committed their fatal error. But the Lord saw the danger that if the priests did drink a lot and get drunk in some way, that they might not distinguish between what was holy and what wasn't. They might not have right discernment. They might not make right decisions. It shows how important it was for them to be fully within their right minds, to be fully sober and serious about the Lord's work. And for us in the New Testament, there are warnings to be sober. Not just sober from a drink point of view. Not just saying, don't get drunk on wine, but also to be sober spiritually, to take spiritual matters seriously, because they are serious before the Lord. So boldness was needed, discernment was needed. Another requirement, which wasn't so much about your character, was that you had to be a Levite to be a doorkeeper. That's how David and Samuel chose the doorkeepers in 1 Chronicles 9. But also 1 Chronicles 9 hints at the fact that they were doorkeepers from the beginning of the tabernacle because it describes Phinehas, the grandson of Aaron, as being rulers over the gatekeepers there. But it's always the Levites that were given this duty. And it's interesting that 1 Chronicles 9 mentions Phinehas as being over those gatekeepers. Because in Numbers 25, we have the story where Phinehas distinguished himself for the Lord. You might remember the story, uh, there were various people from the surrounding nation who were coming and intermingling with the Israelites. They'd been told not to get involved with them, but they were mingling together. And a prince of Israel was even bringing a Midianite woman in the sight of the whole congregation and bringing her into the tent. But Phinehas, the grandson of Aaron, the high priest, he took action. Quite controversial action, we might say today, in taking a spear and killing both of them. But it was what that pleased the Lord, not that the Lord loves bloodshed, but that the Lord saw that somebody cared for his holiness and was prepared to judge in a way which otherwise he would have had to judge the Israelites for not treating his word as, as something to obey and revere. And the Lord blessed Phinehas. So it's quite appropriate that Phinehas should be over the gatekeepers. But the Levites had also taken action. Because there's another story you might remember, which is how the Levites got their position. That was also quite a drastic action they had to take. In Exodus 32, we have the story of the golden calf. 
Moses is up on the mountain. He's taking too long as far as the Israelites are concerned. So they give up on Moses. They give up on God and tell Aaron to uh, give them a God that they can worship. You know, the story Aaron makes the golden calf and uh, the Israelites bow down and worship. Moses comes down. And when he sees the people and what they're doing, he stands in the gate of the camp and he says, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And it says that all the sons of Levi had gathered together to him. I don't know if the Levites had in some way been involved in the calf worship. My guess is maybe not, but... Either way, the point is when Moses issued that call, the Levites decided, yeah, we're going to take a stand for the Lord here. And Moses commanded them to take their swords and to kill various people in the camp in order to bring about uh, a judgment, yes, but also to prevent the Lord from bringing a further judgment. The Levites did that. It would have been difficult. Some of those people would have been people they knew, people they were close to maybe. But because they did that for the Lord and turned his anger away from a much greater judgment, the Lord blessed them. And he called them and set them aside as his special tribe within the special people of God. He called them to be his particular servants who would get to camp around the tabernacle. They would have the closest access to him because they took that costly stand. How appropriate then that they should be gatekeepers. The Levites at this point at least had shown, however costly it was, that they would make sure that where there was something of uncleanness, they would challenge it. Well, from what we've considered tonight, I'm sure you can see by now how we can apply it to things today. The church today, never mind the world, the church today is full of, of uncleanness. People within the church living unclean lives, not being challenged, an unclean practice being allowed into the church, being accepted, even taught within the church. And the gatekeepers have not done their job. The primary gatekeepers today would be the leaders of the churches, the elders, those who should be watching out for the flock as those who will give account to the chief shepherd. The, the leadership of any church are called to be shepherds watching out for the flock, partly making sure that wrong things, unclean things are not allowed in. And they give an account to the chief shepherd. The chief shepherd who himself did the role of a gatekeeper, incidentally, uh, in a sense, when he cleansed the temple. The gatekeepers in Jesus' day hadn't done the right thing because they had allowed people to come in to the Lord's, Lord's house and do all of the money changing and the selling of various things. And Jesus comes and he does their job for them. And he cleanses the temple and he casts out all of these things and says actually the Lord's temple is meant to be holy. It's a place of prayer. It's a place for the Lord, not for all of these earthly things. So the leadership of all churches give an account one day to him. And it's our job, every leader's job is to guard against unclean things coming in from outside and to make sure that we don't teach things and introduce things that are unclean. And yet, sadly, we as leaders have failed in the church in our nation. And same-sex marriage is the most obvious example of that. It's an example we often end up coming back to. Gradually, it started to be accepted in the church because the doorkeepers of the church didn't challenge it. And now we're in a place where it's not just accepted, but it's promoted and fully embraced. And denominations are starting to take it on fully. Remember that Jehoshaphat, he wasn't wicked generally, but he had fellowship with those who were wicked. And gradually that wickedness came in and it resulted in great bloodshed. And here again today we have that that uncleanness has so come in where the gatekeepers previously haven't challenged it. And so it's one thing that we seek to pray about, isn't it? When we come to pray for the nation and for the church, to pray that 
Just like it's not, it wasn't too late for Jesus to cleanse the temple. To pray that some will stand up within the church and say, okay, we've not got it right so far, but we need to take a stand now. And we praise the Lord that some do, but we need to pray for more. And yet the other application for today is not just about the leaders of a church who are to be gatekeepers. Because all of us are called to be gatekeepers for ourselves. To make sure that at least we ourselves are holy for the Lord. Remember that the word tells us, be holy for I am holy says the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 6, it talks about the need for all believers to make sure that they are coming out from anything that is unclean. It talks about not having fellowship with idols. and uh, It says, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. Proverbs 4 and verse 23 says, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. So we all have a job to do as gatekeepers of our own hearts to make sure, are we being holy? Are we making sure we don't allow unholy things in? What about the company that we keep? The company we keep can be a hindrance to us if it's unholy. And we thank the Lord that Paul makes clear, as we considered a while ago in, in 1 Corinthians, I think it is, he makes clear it's not that we're to cut ourselves off from all unbelievers. I mean, how would we do that? How could we witness to unbelievers if we cut ourselves off? But there's also the reminder not to get too close in a way that means that we are dragged down by those we are in companionship with. We need to make sure that we are in some way separate from the world. So that we don't allow unclean influences in. And Jesus, of course, in, uh, sorry, not Jesus, let's not uh, put it that way. Paul, sorry, in Ephesians 4 and verse 29, said the other way around, don't let unclean things out either. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. So all of us have a part to play as a gatekeeper ourselves. We also need to look out for each other, to gently uh, speak to those when it's right. So obviously we need the Lord's wisdom, but when it's right, if we see somebody sinning within the body, to remind them of the need to be clean. And certainly for leaders within our churches, we need to make sure that we are being those gatekeepers, keeping the Lord's place as holy, never mind what the world does. We make sure the Lord's dwelling place is holy. So the next time that somebody quotes to you or that you, you quote somebody else, uh, rather better to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. Well, that's a good reminder, isn't it, of uh, what it means to be a doorkeeper. It wasn't just being polite. It was a vital role. And we all have the privilege of playing something of that today. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many instructions that we can gain from the Old Testament and from the things you laid down for your chosen people of Israel. Lord, we ask that you'd help us to appreciate afresh how holy you are and why it is that we need to be holy. Lord, we pray that we might have something of that attitude of Phinehas, ultimately shown by your son cleansing the temple. Lord, that it would be something of a concern, a great concern to us when there is uncleanness, whether in our lives or creeping into the church. We pray for that attitude that is willing to challenge it, even if it's a costly stand. I think we would all say we don't naturally have that uh, courage ourselves, but we pray that you would make us valiant where we need to be. And we pray that we would be a holy people, May we as a church here be a holy people to you. May we not allow anything of the world in. Help us indeed to welcome those who are of the world amongst us. But may we not allow the world to enter into us uh, with its uncleanness. So we pray for your help, Lord, and pray that we would please you with our attitude to your holiness. 
We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.